Let's go somewhere today. Um, so, hey, if you have your Bibles, we're going to start out in Matthew 28. Woo! And we're going to flip into John 4. So if you're like, i got to know where we're going. We're going Matthew 28, then John 4, and we'll go somewhere else after that. We're talking about living water today. Man, God is so good, church, isn't he? Ah, I love you guys. It's always an honor just to get to break bread with you guys. And so I'm thankful. And uh, let's just see where we go. Okay, so living water. And I started kind of tiptoeing into this message on Wednesday night. And uh, I just feel like we got some, some good stuff to just dig into. Um, I'm going to give you a little background uh, on where, how God began to just reveal in me and, uh, and speak this word into me. Um, and, and so if you guys know anything, uh, if you know me a little bit, I, I'm really passionate. I love the idea of city change. Um, I, believe that, I believe that as believers, we are called and sent forth to disciple nations. I believe that that is part of the Great Commission. So if you have your Bible, let's prove it in Scripture. Matthew 28, 16, let's get it. Get it, somebody. I believe that we are called to disciple nations. I believe that that, that, that that is the heart of God, that God loves cities because God loves the people in cities. And I believe that, that cities, um, they have, there is a, there's a spiritual realm over a city. There is an influence about a city. And you guys can, even if, even if you're not like think, thinking and flowing in that, just think about it. Just think about some of the strongholds in the towns that you know. Whether it be this town is extremely, like, political. This town is extremely about keeping up with the Joneses. This town, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, towns have spiritual strongholds in them. And, and I'll tell you, when, when God really started to wreck my heart about this, um, it was when me and my wife were going, we were actually traveling out west. It was really, it was such a cool deal. It was like two or three years ago. Um, and so we just jumped in the car. Um, I get a month off. So we took that month and we just drove. Uh, and we, we, we knew we were going west. Go west, young lad, go west. Um, I'm not saying it was a voice from the Lord, but it was a voice from somewhere. And, uh, and, so, and so we just start driving, and we have our tent and everything. And uh, we would, we, it would get night, and we'd be like, well, we need to camp somewhere. Uh, we'd find some place to camp. We'd pitch a tent. We would camp uh, and just, just did that. Uh, we had a few destinations. It was just awesome. Um, but one of the things that God started to just uh, wreck our hearts were about was about the cities we were passing through um, because we were passing through a lot of towns and cities on the way. Um, and we felt like there was more purpose in us just um, driving through them, but begin to just pray and release kingdom over these places. And so, and so we just begin to ask God, Father God, what, is, what are some of the spiritual strongholds in this town? And we would just begin to pray against it. Father God, what do you wanna release over this city? And we would just listen. And see what God wanted to release, whether it was, was hope, whether it was um, just a resurgence of unity, um, whatever it was. And so, like, I want in a side note, just tell you guys, ask God about your towns. Because God has a heart for the places where you live. He has a heart for that town, your community leaders, the people in business, your schools, your government entities, all of those places. God wants, wants kingdom in those areas because kingdom transforms cities. Kingdoms transforms workplaces, homes, all these things. So if you have your Bible, let's jump in there. And it says in Matthew chapter 28, we're finally there. I'm, I'm going to start with verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. I believe that God's heart is for the nations. I believe that it's for the United States. I believe it's for Kenya. I believe it's for Saudi Arabia. I believe that there is not a nation under the sun that God's heart does not break and yearn for. And I believe that as believers, we are the salt and the light that's sent out into these places to bring kingdom, to release hope, to release the power of God in, in business and in communities. And, and, and that through that, through that kingdom lens coming into those places, Cities are transformed. They are fathered and mothered by believers. And as cities fall to the kingdom, nations fall to the kingdom. So that's my heart. That's, that's, that's what kind of stirs me up. And, and what I believe that, 
I believe that I'm called to even in my workplace. And so here's, here's, here's what happened is that, is that over the summer, how many people in education in here? We got a few? All right. You guys feel the glory over summertime, don't you? You're like, oh, bless God. Woo. Glory, glory. And not just because it's nice and warm and sunny and pools are open, right? There's other reasons. Um, just that refreshing and that, 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 just that time off, right? It's really cool. Um, and so I love my summer times. Um, I get to spend them with the two most amazing women in the world. My beautiful Vivian Grace, my beautiful wife Promise. I'm just blessed, dudes. And um, I am, man. I always like to tell people I'm married up. They see my wife and, and my kiddo, and they're like, yeah, you did. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but seriously, like, like, one of the things that I love is that through our summer, like, I just get to enjoy the presence of my family. And it's awesome, right? And um, one thing that Prom and I really go after is just cultivating an atmosphere of peace and love and championing, 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 <laughs> rural, championing um, one another. Um, and that's just really, really nice, right? And so, like, like, by the end of the summertime, I'm like, oh, man, I'm refreshed, I'm laid back. And then work starts. I didn't say anything about it. I just kind of let it drop. <laughs> no. um, but, but, and I love my job, right? I love that I get to work with kiddos. It's the best part of education, right? You get to just, I mean, honestly, I tell people what I do in my day is I just get to go in and father. You know, I get to father kiddos. I get to father employees. Um, and, and what that means is I get to protect, empower, and just, and just speak to their identity in God, right? That's, that's, that's what I really feel is part of the call in my life. Now, there's logistical aspects I have to do too, but that's what's in my heart. And I believe that, that as I bring that aspect of kingdom into that place, it transforms a community and transforms a city, right? Um, and, and so what, what began to happen is I go back to work, and all of a sudden... Everything isn't always peaceful. I, I bet none of you guys experience that in your workplace. <laughs> right? Um, and, and I love the people I work with, but there's also this level, like, I start to all of a sudden I hear complaints. And, like, there's, they, I hear, we'll hear gossip and that kind of stuff. And then parents will get on Facebook and blast things. And um, I know none of you do that, bless God. Right? I often, I often, I often say Facebook is a coward's playground. Um, it, <laughs> Because you can, everybody gets real brave behind a keyboard. Um, but anyhow, that's neither here nor there. Bless God, we love them and we love their hearts. Um, but I go back into that from being really, really, really peaceful. And like sometimes it's like, it's like culture shock. Like you're in there and you're like, wow, what in the world? This is my job? Um, but, uh, and, and so like what, started, what starts to happen sometimes is that I can lose focus. I get distracted from the vision that God has put in me. I can start to listen to the voices. It's like, oh, it shouldn't be that hard. It should, there shouldn't be that many obstacles. Church, I, I want to tell you, just because you have obstacles on the way to your dream does not make your dream null and void. There is a strengthening and a growth that comes when you're pressed. Right? And so if you have your Bibles, let's go to John 4 real quick because we want to get into that. We want to look at that aspect because God started to speak into my heart about the fact that, that, that just because we were facing opposition didn't mean that we had missed God. Right? You can still face opposition and be right smack dab in the will of God. You look at Jesus. How many people came up against him when we know that he was in the will of God going to the cross? Even Peter said, but you shouldn't go to that. And he was like, get behind me, Satan. Even people close can be oppressive, can, be, can, can put a quabosh on the move of God. If you let it get into your heart, you have to be true to what God has spoken in you. We're going to get somewhere. We're going to get somewhere. All right, John 4. Are you there? All right, let's read something. Uh, I'm actually going to just recap real quick. Okay, so uh, the beginning of this is that Jesus is going, um, he's actually leaving Judea and going to Galilee. Uh, but he, uh, he actually goes through Samaria. Now, a couple things. He didn't have to go through Samaria. He made a choice to travel through Samaria. Now, I think this is interesting because most Jewish people would not make that choice. Why? I'm going to tell you, hold on. 
Okay, so that's where we're at. And so he's made this choice to go through Samaria, and about the sixth hour of the day, this woman from Samaria comes up to draw water. That's verse 7. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Now, she says a lot in that little bit, okay? Because first of all, we have to understand some of the culture at the time. Rabbinical Jews looked down on Samaritans, and for a few reasons. One, they thought that the Samaritans had intermarried with pagan entities, all right? The Samaritans also, uh, they worshipped at a different mountain. They didn't believe Mount Zion was the holy mountain. Additionally, the Samaritans only took the first five books of the Old Testament. So there's all these things that Jews looked down at Samaritans about. They didn't like them. They thought because the way they believed, well, they were wrong, and they were less than Jews. I'm sure we don't look down on any other religions because of that. Jesus comes to this woman, and he opens a conversation with her. Because that's what I love about Jesus. Even though there was this cultural stigma at the time for him to talk to this Samaritan and to talk to this woman. See, she was like a double negative. Because see, in this century, in the first century, rabbis, the leading thought of the time, Eliezer, who was a rabbi at the time, said, I would rather have the Torah burned than taught to a woman. Now that's pretty strong prejudice, right? But you know what? Jesus that's what we love about Jesus. And see, that's what I love about the kingdom, is that the kingdom goes right in, in the midst of cultural oppression, and releases hope, and releases life, and breaks down the walls of prejudice that would divide and isolate individuals. That's the hope of the kingdom. The kingdom has no walls. The kingdom is in us, through us, and moving out of us. It's all around, guys. And so Jesus comes into this place, and he begins to enter into a conversation with this woman. Um, and she's like, what is going on? I'm from Samaria, and I'm a chick, but yet you're talking to me. Let's go on. Let's see what Jesus says. He's going to do more than just talk, too. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Hmm. Come on, Jesus. He's taking a step farther. He's not just talking. He's starting to teach. He is starting to release kingdom to this Samaritan woman. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? See, Jesus was talking about something in the spiritual, and she was receiving something in the natural. He was talking about spiritual, she was hearing natural. Spiritual versus natural, right? But this is what's really cool. As we get into this, we're going to see that the spiritual that Jesus was releasing becomes a harvest in her as time goes on. Let's watch. I believe that God has spoken some things to us in the spiritual and planted it in our hearts. And maybe we've looked at it with a natural lens. And so I just say, Holy Spirit, breathe. Breathe on some of those dreams. Breathe on some of that that God, Holy Spirit, is stirring up in Jesus' name. Okay. And so, here we go. She goes, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank, this is verse 12, from it himself, as did his sons and livestock? Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. You know, that's... Oftentimes, the world says, drink from our well. Drink from our wisdom. Drink from our knowledge. Drink from our way of thinking it. And how many of you know that every time we go to the world for our sustenance, we're actually drinking spoiled water? Verse 14. But whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. So Jesus is saying, listen, I am going to release in you living water. Now this is actually a quote of a scripture in Isaiah. If you have your Bibles, we can turn there. They'll throw it up on the screen. It's actually Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. 
So Jesus begins talking about living water. And I'm like, What's, where, where are you going, Jesus? Well, see, this living water was a, was a direct quote from where um, he, Isaiah was prophesying some stuff. And Isaiah says, therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the well of salvation. Jesus was actually ministering the gospel of salvation to this Samaritan woman. Jesus had came that day with a divine meetup with a lady who he was going to release salvation to. Come on, church. How many divine meetups do we have in the course of our day? And we discount them because it's so-and-so or it's this person. They look this way. They sound that way. And all of a sudden, I'm too focused on my business and my to-do list that I can't see the person and the need that the Holy Spirit is pulling me to. Come on, church. I feel like that sometimes in my day. I feel like I've got a list that I'm, I'm walking off, and I'm missing, a, I'm missing the person in the midst of that list. Here's Jesus. And Jesus is always just stopping and seeing the person, seeing the need, seeing the where they're at and what he can pour to them. It's really a laid down life, isn't it? It's pretty cool. Okay, so we go on. So he's talking about this well of salvation. Now in Isaiah 12, it goes on to then prophetically utter about salvation and the coming Messiah. So Jesus was actually releasing a prophecy about himself to this lady. So he's saying, I'm going to release this salvation that's going to release life inside of you. Now get your Bible. Keep turning in John. Let's go over to John chapter something. No, <laughs> John chapter 7, verse 37. John chapter 7, verse 37. Let's check it out. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and he cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. What do you think about my Jesus impersonation? <laughs> First service thought it lacked a little bit of gusto, so I tried to really, you know, rev it up a little for you guys. No. <laughs> Just playing. <laughs> um, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So here's another example of Jesus in the midst of them. He stands up. Now, that, remember, we're in the midst of this festival. So they've been eating and drinking and feasting and being Mary or Frank or Tom or whoever. And so, like, he's standing up and he says, if anyone thirsts, well, they've been drinking this whole time. It's like when you go to, like, Golden Corral and after, like, your fifth plate, you're like... Who's still hungry for dessert? <laughs> like no one is, but you still have it because it's ice cream, right? But <laughs> bless God, not the spirit of gluttony at all. <laughs> so anyhow, everybody, their thirst is quenched, right? And yet he stands up and he says, who is thirsty? Come to me. Come to the source, the well of life that will, when you drink from it, it will cause a living, flowing, Holy Spirit baptism to flow out of you. Come on, somebody. That's what Jesus was talking about. He was talking about that, that gift of salvation and that indwelling power of the Holy Spirit that's going to bring life to believers. And see, Jesus was telling me, back to the start of the story, as I was going through that time uh, where I was just oh, so divided about what I was doing with my life, just seeing, just experiencing that, that, that those first times back at work and lamenting to be back at home. Thinking about city change and thinking about, that's ah, too tough. I just miss God. It would be easier just to do, just, just do a job. Why does there have to be this vision with it? <laughs> I'm being honest. And then... And then God started to take me back to the OT. And he just started to show me people who without the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit were accomplishing city change. Because you know what? Sometimes in the midst of your journey, you got to stir up with remembrance of what God has done for you. 
Because sometimes you got to remember the miracle working power in Jehovah Jireh. You got to remember the, that God has done it for others, He's going to do it for you. You got to remember when God has done it for you, and then He'll do it again. And see, that he, God took me back to Joseph, and He began to show me Joseph and how, how here's this guy who is actually sold into slavery by his brothers. Now, you talk about a root of rejection. They threw me, I, this could have been a perfect moment to just be like, nobody loves me. I'm a horrible person. My own family hates me. I should just lay down and die. But see, isn't that where the enemy wants to get you? He wants to get you where it looks like all the things that are happening to you are way bigger than what they are. He wants, to, he wants you to feel that you're all alone, that you do not have a friend to go through it. But Jesus says that he is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And thank you, Jesus, because Joseph had some drag nasty brothers operating on him, right? And so, and so I just want to encourage you, the farther we get away from God, the bigger the mountain looks. But the closer we get to God, the smaller it seems, because with God, all things are possible. With God, you can go over that mountain through it you can speak to it and say mountain be gone that's the resurrection power that's in the hearts of believers well anyhow so we see joseph and so we sold into slavery and then he raises he, he rises up in potiphar's house why because there is the favor of god on him church you have the favor of god on you not only that, you have the favor of God and the favor of man. And see, churches, we spend time in the presence of the Lord because that's what it's about. It's about spending time with God, getting to know that really good friend. That's what it's about in your life, right? How do I get closer to my wife? I spend time with her. I talk to her. She's a person, right? We do stuff together. That's, that's how I grow with her. That's how we grow with God. So, so we see Joseph, and we see him in Potiphar's house, and like he's rising, and sees, we know that people can increase with the favor of God and the favor of man. Why? Because Jesus did it. It says in the scriptures, in the book of Luke, that Jesus increased with the favor of God and the favor of man. What was he doing to increase in the favor? Now, this is kind of a mind blower, too, because here is Jesus, and he's increasing in favor. You would be like, he's just born into it. Well, he was, but he still increased in it. So that means, he, that means we still increase in it. So Joseph increased in favor in Potiphar's house. He actually became the manager over his house. And then Potiphar's wives was like, Joseph trying to mook up on me. He trying to, you know, he doing something not right. Because Joseph rejected her advances. So she says that. Then Potiphar is like, Potiphar's like, what? Oh, no, I'm throwing you into prison. So here is Joseph, who was sold into slavery, risen by favor of God in the house of Potiphar, and then thrown back into prison. Yeah. I'm telling you what. And the old boy refused to quit. Come on, somebody, get a hold of that. <laughs> he then, then he's in prison, and the gift of dreams and interpretations of dreams that was in him opened a door for him to go into the house of Pharaoh. Now watch this. In the house of Pharaoh... He begins to be the provider over Egypt. <laughs> and when the famines come, the people of Israel, the people of God are saved because there is a believer in the house of Pharaoh that, th that was serving a pagan king, that was actually making a pagan king look like a genius. And yet God discipled a nation, saved a nation by the presence of that man in the Pharaoh's courts. Church, that's you. That is you. You are poised and positioned where you're at to bring that hope, to bring that kingdom lens into those places. And don't, man, I just want to encourage you, don't lose hope in the fact that you are, you are doing something for God right where you're at. Mm. Get some of that living water, right? <laughs> just playing. Okay. So let's jump back. Let's look at some other stuff. So I, go to Galatians 5 if you've got your Bible. So as we're going to Galatians 5, we want to talk about this living water, this Holy Spirit, this, this salvation that's inside of us. And I found that, like, as I was going back to work, I wasn't drinking from the right fountain. I was drinking, follow with me here. 
Sometimes when people are hateful to you, your flesh man wants to be hateful back. Sometimes when people are being difficult, you want to be just as difficult back. Now, how many people know hurting people hurt people? If I'm just as hateful back as they are throwing at me, how do they see any difference? They're getting exactly what they expect to get from the world. But my Bible reads that we are not of the world, that there's something more inside of me. And so I was drinking from this fountain where I was listening to, I was listening to other voices, right? But watch this, Galatians 5. Let's jump down. We're going to look at some of the fruits of the Spirit. Let's actually jump down. Um, verse 18. 5.18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry. You know, if I was really good, I would like make up a rap about this. Um, <laughs> I'm too white though, I can't, I cannot. I'm like clear, I'm like, and then I can't sing, it's just all bad, so... Anyhow, so I'm just going to read the scripture, right? Uh, but then it goes on to verse 22. Now, this is where it changes. This is where, like, you push the clutch, you shift the gear, because it says, but the fruit of the Spirit. Now, remember, Jesus in John 7 was talking about how the Spirit of the living God would become a fountain coming out of you of rivers of, rivers of living water. Livers of what? No. <laughs> Somebody's like, chicken liver is awful. Don't even. But listen, it's, I believe this. You can deep fry anything, and it's good. I don't know if Paul said that or James, but um, somebody, the colonel, <laughs> I don't know. So, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That is what is up inside of us. But you know what? I, I, and I don't, have to, I don't have to make that come out of me. I'm not like, I'm not like, patience. As I spend time in the presence of the living God, as I get stirred up by him, whether it be through his word, through worship, through prayer, through just setting, just listening, just soaking, I get his heart. Right? Remember, he talks about this. He says, he says I'm, I'm going to write the commandments on the tablets of their heart. It's going to become internal. It's no longer, it's no longer I'm trying to like seek after something. I'm operating from inside out. Think about David, okay? In, in scripture, it says that David was a man after God's own heart. I'm like, where's the playbook for that? What, how does, well, yes, I want to implement that, you know, whatever that looks like. But then you start to study David. And how did David roll? Well, he was, he was, he was a younger, he was a younger brother. He had some brothers. He had a papa. And his papa sent him out to a field to hang out with some sheep. He's got a shepherd's crook. And like in those moments of solitude, I believe David was just spending time with God. Maybe he was strumming that harp. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Writing a psalm or two. Do you realize that David's model of worshiping God, Davidic worship, is what we still use today? where we sing and we magnify the name of the Lord. We usher in his presence. All right, because David sat and, 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 and just drank in the presence. Now, this is what, this is, what is, is, is just mind-blowing, is that, okay, so David said, and, and see, God begins to search because Saul, um, the people wanted a king, so, so God gave them Saul. Saul looked like a king, but he didn't have the integrity in the heart of God. So God began to search for a person to be king. And he finds this little shepherd boy. He doesn't look the part. But he has the heart of God. Because he spends time in the presence of God. He begins to know God. And so he, God, God dispatches Samuel. And Samuel's like, I must go. I've got a horn and I've got oil. I'm going to dump it on him. Okay, he dumps, he anoints David king. All right, now think about this for a second. David is anointed king. And then for 10 to 13 years, he's not king. But God anointed him through Samuel 10 years ago. Why wasn't it an instant deliverance? Why wasn't there instant breakthrough? Where was like the chorus of the people of Judah coming out and blowing trumpets and people like dancing or something and being like, great King David. But you know what? Even, even if the promise tarries, 
God is faithful. Whether it's 10, 15, 20 years, five minutes, whatever it is, God is faithful. Listen, I understand. I understand our society now. It's like you sit in the drive through line of Krispy Kreme wanting your pumpkin spice latte, and you're waiting there for four or five minutes. You're like, what's going on? <laughs> pumpkin spice lattes are only here for a certain amount of time, and winter is coming. <laughs> Bless God. And now I have these pumpkin spice donuts. I went through that line in like a minute. But then you think of the timeline of David. 10 to 13 years. And this is is what's mind-blowing. So like he's anointed, he's anointed king. And like he ends up, I mean, God, he brings him into the court of Saul. All right, so Saul was the other king. And you're thinking, oh, David has been called. God is going to have Saul standing by him and say, you see this? Get right under here, kid. I'm taking you under my wing false Saul picks up a spear and hurls it at his face David's married to Saul's daughter at this time like if your father-in-law just doesn't want to take you out to the wood shop and talk it's okay right (laughs) he's not trying to kill you (laughs) David has to flee the city But he was anointed to be king on the throne in that city. Yeah. Opposition doesn't mean the call is null and void. So David, he's out here and he's still, he's beginning to gather people to him. Because he does have an anointing, right? To be a leader. So people are coming to him. But it's like, it's like the people that you're like, oh, it's you? Okay. Okay. That's what it says in Scripture, not those words, right? Obviously, it doesn't have my inflection. But it's like the, 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 the kind of the cast-offs are who begin to gravitate to David. David literally lives in a cave for a little bit of time. And in this time, do you know what he starts to do? He starts to father these men that have gravitated to him. He starts to, he starts to teach and encourage and bring them up. These men actually become giant killers. Who was the first giant killer? David. I believe that there is a kingdom principle. When you get under, a, when you get under leadership and you serve well, that God, that God blesses you with the level of that leadership. Those men were able to kill giants because they served and honored under a man who had blazed that trail. I believe there is such honor and power when we honor our leadership. Anyhow, so David, David then, he, there's this battle coming up between the Philistines and the Israelites. And see, David at this time is living in a Philistine city. So he comes to the Philistines and he's like, hey, I will go out with you and we will fight Israel together. And the Philistines are like, nah, buddy. They thought he was going to jump on the Israelites' side to get back into Saul's good graces and kill them. So they were like, nah, you stay here. So they go to the battle. Now, it's actually in this battle that Saul and his son Jonathan were killed. David goes back to the town that he was staying at with his mighty men. He finds the town sacked. His, the women and children were taken away. The Amalekites, the Amorites, one of those ites had taken him, right? And so in this moment, so his mighty men turn on him and they're like picking up stones. Should we stone him? I just want to think for just a second about the, about the rejection that you might feel in that situation. I mean, like, battle after battle, stretching after stretching, and you get to this point where the same people that you are, like, fathering and you're bringing up are turning stones to throw at you. But what did David do? It says that he went out and he stirred himself up in the Lord. He went back to shepherd moment and just started started praising, worshiping, ushering in that presence to be strengthened, to be built up, to be edified in the Lord, church. And then as he went back, as he went back, the Holy Spirit began to speak through him. And he says to his mighty men, he said, let's go take it back. 
Let's go back into the enemy's camp and take back what they've stolen from us. And these mighty men are like, yeah, that's a way better idea. But you see, it was only a matter of coming into the presence and getting the download of the wisdom of God that he could take back into a situation. Sometimes we shoot our mouths off before we get into the presence of the Lord and we entertain a spirit of stupid instead of the wisdom of the kingdom. Glory. David went back to the source. And then you know what happened? They went back to the enemy's camp. They took back their women and children. And David then began to march in to the throne room that God had anointed him for. Though it tarry for a moment, what God has spoken in your heart shall come to pass. Guys, we serve a God of hope. A God that is bigger than situations, that's bigger than circumstances. Sometimes in the midst of the circumstance, I can start drinking from the wrong well. But I'm telling you what, I'm not, I'm not throwing a stone or heaping on shame. I'm just saying, consider the source. 2 Corinthians talks about you become what you behold. As we go from glory to glory, what are we looking at? Because I believe that we are all called to manifest the image of God through our works, our deeds, our thoughts, our actions. I believe that's what David did as a man after God's own heart. I just want to encourage you in that. 